What does it take to build a little-known tech startup into a billion-dollar business? Just ask Meg Whitman, who rose to become one of Silicon Valley's most powerful CEOs in the early days of the internet. Best known for her role as chief executive at eBay and Hewlett Packard, Whitman is now focusing on her third act, creating a new way to experience video on your mobile phone. And she's launching the app during one of the most tenuous periods in American history. On this episode of Influencers, I catch up with Meg as she unveils Quibi, her revolutionary storytelling platform to a world stuck, isolated at home. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to Influencers and welcome to our guest, Meg Whitman, CEO of Quibi, former CEO of eBay and Hewlett Packard. Meg, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, nice to be with you, virtually. <laughs> right. Where are we talking to you from? Uh, Sacramento, California. Um, my husband's a medical professional here, so I decided to, to come up and be with him because he couldn't come to L.A. where we live now. Right, and I'm talking to you from Maine, so it's coast to coast here. And that's yeah. what it's like these days, right? It is, it really is. So congratulations on the launch of Quibi. Uh, how's it going? Yeah, well, we're really pleased. We launched yesterday, um, and uh, we were really pleased with our first day results. We're number three in the Apple App Store, only behind TikTok and Zoom, which is pretty fun. And uh, number two in the entertainment uh, category behind TikTok, but ahead of Disney Plus and ahead of Netflix. So we're feeling good about our first day. I say to our team, it's one day, um, but it was a good first day for us. Yeah, I understand you had a little bit of a hiccup, which maybe is to be expected when you're kind of doing a massive launch like that. Everything going okay on the technical side? Yeah, we had a little partial um, outage for a little less than an hour um, where we had a, a little problem with our backend database, but our great tech team got in there. You know, we're all on Google Cloud, so the Google Cloud team was helpful, and, and we, got it, we got it fixed fast, way faster than my outage in 1999 at eBay. <laughs> that famous outage, yes. We'll get, maybe get into that a little bit. Um, yeah, we've been working with the Google team, too, and uh, a little plug for them. They've been great uh, for us as well over here at Yahoo. Um, so let's talk about Quibi a little bit. Um, it's new. It's mobile first, mobile only, short form. What's the conceit here? Yeah. Well, so it is an app. Um, you go to the App Store or the Google Play Store to download it. And it is an app that was designed to bring together Hollywood and Silicon Valley, take the quality and storytelling capability of Hollywood and bring it to the mobile phone. And we had to build a technology platform that would allow uh, that kind of content to look fantastic on your phone. And uh, so, and then we decided that it needed to be mobile only because, you know, we said this is going to be on the go and, you know, in for your in-between moments. And so every chapter on Quibi is less than 10 minutes. It could be a two-hour movie, but told in 10-minute chapters. Or it could be, um, you know, 15 chapters of a documentary or something like that. But every chapter or every episode is less than 10 minutes. And then, of course, we have our daily essentials of news, sports, weather, um, gaming news, celebrity news. And those are all, you know, six to eight minutes, but produced every day. Right. And you had this roadmap and this game plan. And then all of a sudden the coronavirus hits. And how did that change everything? Yeah, well, it did change a lot, <laughs> that's for sure. I think the organization and our partners deserve tremendous credit for flexibility. Well, let's start with our launch event. We had planned a physical launch event with a classic Hollywood uh, junket, press junket on Sunday morning, um, April 5th, then a big red carpet event with 158 stars who were going to walk the red carpet and do the pull-off interviews like you always see, and then a party for 1,500 that was sponsored by our advertising partners. Well, that obviously had to go away, right? So then we said, how can we do that event digitally? And yesterday we did it on Instagram Live with well over 40 stars doing interviews of their friends who also had shows on Quibi. So that was a completely different launch event. Media had to change entirely. We were going to be one of the largest advertisers on March Madness. And the finals of the NCAAs were on our launch day, which we thought was fantastic. How great would that be, you know? Um, well, of course, you know, the NCAA 
you know, stop playing. So we had to think about how we would redeploy those media dollars. And then we had to decide, um, you know, how to produce our daily essentials, which are being produced by our studio partners of NBC and ESPN and all these. How are they going to do it? And we have to work with them to figure that out. And then we have to run the company virtually for three weeks before launch. So it was a pretty big task, but I'm really glad we did it because we're not medical professionals. We're not first responders. What we are is entertainers. And if we could bring a little levity and joy to, to people's lives in this difficult situation, we felt like we should launch. So we did. I mean, was there a point where you just said, go, no, go, let's do this thing? Yeah. About three weeks out when we all realized we were going to have to work from home, Jeffrey Katzenberg and I sat down and said, first of all, can we launch? You know, the technology was ready to go all in the Google Cloud. I mean, this is so different, right, than eBay. We, there's no, there's no um, data center. There's no network operations center. This is all in the cloud. So we knew we could, and our engineers could launch it from their homes. And then we had to say, do we have enough content? What's the content pipeline look like? Because much of Hollywood has been shut down. Well, we have enough content to get us through November. So we said, okay, we can launch. And then we said, should we launch? And we ultimately decided for the reason I described that we should. So we went ahead. And you mentioned Jeffrey Katzenberg, your partner, Meg. And can you talk about that relationship? Did you work with him at DreamWorks and Disney? Or how have you known him all uh, these years? First, we first met at uh, Disney, like we like to say, back in the Jurassic period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was head of the Walt Disney Studios, and I was running marketing for consumer products. So we got to know each other there and became good friends. And then um, when he um, joined DreamWorks, then he spun off DreamWorks Animation, you might remember, into a public company. He asked me to be on his board. I was at eBay at the time. And so I joined his board where we worked together for three or four years. And then um, when I went to HP, by chance, HP and DreamWorks had a very tight technology partner partnership. Most of DreamWorks ran on HP software and hardware. And they were, um, you know, a customer sort of demonstration case for us. So we did a lot of things together there. And we kept up over the years. And so when I stepped down from HP after six and a half years, I told the board I would stay five. I was still there six and a half years later. He called me literally that same day. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm chairman of Teach for America. I'm going to, you know, travel and take a little time off. And he said, no, what are you doing tonight for dinner? <laughs> right. And he flew up and he shared with me the idea for Kobe. At the end of dinner, I said, this is a really good idea. Did some due diligence and then said, you know, I think I got another startup in me. So that's how it came to pass. Yeah, I mean, you guys uh, have had tremendous success. I mean, both of you, I think I read, you know, this is sort of the third one for both of you, right? So he had Disney and DreamWorks. You had eBay and HP. And now you're both on your third act. So what's that all about, Meg? <laughs> well, I, you know, we both like to work. And we both love a challenge. I mean, I've loved a challenge since I was a little girl. Nothing makes me happier than to do something that's really hard and maybe never been done before. Um, you know, when I went to eBay, people thought I was nuts. When I went to HP, they really thought I was nuts. And um, so I just said, you know, this would be really fun and interesting and, you know, been friends with Jeffrey for a long time. And it's doing something that has not been done before. And I think Jeffrey feels the same way. He likes to say we both live in that space between improbable and impossible. And is he kind of the L.A. Um, creative person? You're kind of the no-cal tech person. Is that how it works? I mean, yeah, we're all in L.A. Um, the company's all in one place because we decided to enable technology and have technology enable this new um, way of storytelling that we all had to be together. So that was the first decision we made. It had to be in L.A. and we all had to be together. So he as the founder. He's the chairman. He's also chief creative officer. And then I'm obviously responsible for the tech platform, the advertising sales, the marketing, marketing strategy, the financial architecture, the strategy of the whole company, and um, you know how this all fits together. Um, so we work together very, very closely. We sit you know, 20 feet away from each other on the same floor and probably talk six or eight times a day. Do you have access to some of these stars? Uh, and who are some of your favorites? What are some of your favorite shows? And how's that yeah. going? Yeah. Well, um, my probably my favorite movie in chapters, you know, because we, we have these movies, as I said, in chapters, is yeah. Survive, which stars Sophie Turner from Game of Thrones and Corey Hawkins, a fabulous romance story, romantic story after a plane crash. Mm -hmm. My favorite um, documentary is LeBron James, and I, the, it's called I Promise, and it's about his school in Akron, Ohio, that he set up for low-income third and fourth graders, and then he's adding a grade every year. 
And it just speaks to me. You know, as I said, I'm chairman of Teach for America. I think education is the most important thing for our country. And uh, so that documentary really spoke to me. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And then of the Daily Essentials, I love them all. But one that surprised me is Rachel Hollis. She is a guru to millennial moms. And she has a daily talk show with us. I'm not a millennial. I am a mom. Mm -hmm. And I just love the show. And it's sort of a daily inspirational, you know, here's what you can work on today. So I, I really enjoy her show. She's great. Yeah, and there certainly is a lot of content there. You guys have dozens and dozens of shows and more to come. Yeah, we, launched, we launched with 44 different shows. And we'll have 175 shows by the end of the year. And that turnstile technology that you uh, mentioned a little bit is pretty cool that, you know, works in both modes seamlessly, right? Is that yeah. your own proprietary technology? It is. It is. It was invented by our engineers. And here's how it came about. We said, listen, if we're going to make watching Hollywood quality content on your phone, what's one of the things that we want to try to make better? And that is that ability to see full screen um, video in very high quality, whether you hold your phone in portrait or whether you hold your phone in landscape. So we looked at lots of different ways to get that done and ultimately created a, a completely new way. We got a patent on it about two months ago that uh, stitches the vertical cut that we get from the creator and the horizontal cut, stitches it together, and then we know which way to show it to you based on the gyroscope in your phone. Right. I mean, that's part of what differentiates you guys because, of course, make a lot of people talk about peak content but your stuff is created for mobile and it's also episodic in a different way. So do you feel like that is enough of a differentiator? Yeah, we think so. I mean, nothing like this has been done before. And I think it's Hollywood quality content in shorter form made specifically and only for mobile. And every bit of content is um, original to Quibi because it had to be shot differently by the creators. It had to be rendered differently, and, and it had to, has to be shown on this different platform. So all of that is completely unique, never been done before. Right. And the structure of the company, I mean, you guys have a lot of high-profile investors. Have you planned this out so you would do an IPO at some point? I mean, what are you looking to do with Quibi in terms of it being a company? Well, Jeffrey and I hope we'll run it. Um, you know, we love doing this. It's great fun, and uh, we've loved building the company. Um, you know, I think probably, you know, if you had to forecast, maybe an IPO is in our future. A little hard to tell. You know, we're day two after launch. So come ask me that question in a year and, uh, you know, we'll probably we'll have a, a clearer idea. But, yeah, we've got some great investors. All the studios are in Hollywood are investors in the platform. And that's been important because not only did they help fund the company, they gave us access to their best IP and their best show running talent, which makes a difference in Hollywood. And about how many people do you have working there now, Meg? About 255. Wow. Yeah, you really scaled up. Um, let me shift gears a little bit and ask you, um, as a CEO, about the coronavirus and the economic impact that's going to have and how bad you think it's going to be and how can we pull ourselves out of this? Yeah. Well, I don't know, Andy. Um, you know, I, I am. I, I think it's almost impossible to predict how long this will be. I think, you know, I'm pretty much assuming we're not going to go back to work for all of April and maybe May. And then let's see what happens. Um, I think, you know, California has done a good job here. You're starting to see the flattening of the curve. I think Gavin Newsom has stepped up, you know, created, um, you know, a sense of urgency really early on, got people to shelter in place. And, uh, and I think that's actually working. The hospital facilities here are not yet overwhelmed and maybe won't be. Um, so let's see how it goes. I mean, I know everyone is anxious to get back to work. There's no question the economic, um, you know, cost here is enormous. But it's most important, in my view, how do we save lives? How do we, you know, make sure that the health care needs get taken care of first? And then we'll, we'll figure out how to get out of this, you know, economic challenge. I mean, it's, it's very different to me than, um, you know, the crash of 2008, which was, as you recall, Andy, a very long way out. I mean, it took 10 years. I think this will be, once we go back to work, this will be a pretty sharp V, would be my, my sense. But I don't know. I think this is uncharted territory for all of us. Yeah, it really is. I mean, have you given thought to that decision about going back to work? Say, I mean, you ran for governor of California. Say you were in Gavin's chair how would you decide between protecting people's health and economics, you know, trying to get the state back and running? Yeah, it's a balance, of course, but I think you have to come down on the side of the scientists and what's right for, um, you know, containing this 
quite um, you know, serious virus. And so I think you have to listen to the healthcare professionals and the scientists and say, what's the right thing to do um, for the health of our people? And then, you know, then try to figure out how we're going to come out of this once that is well under control. And viruses don't last forever. Um, you know, this will eventually, um, you know, come to a point where people can go back to work. But I think you have to keep people safe first and foremost. Right. And how's your husband doing? He said he's a doctor there in Sacramento. And so is he on the front lines, right? Is he doing all right? Yeah, he is. He is. Um, you know, and the good news is that the medical centers here are not yet overwhelmed. They're busy. Um, with their, you know, regular patients who, you know, people are still getting sick. People are still having heart attacks. People still need brain surgeries. People need what they've always had. Everything is layered on top of that. And so how do you make room for both? So it's been fascinating to watch him and fascinating to watch these medical centers get prepared. We should be really grateful for the nurses, the anesthesiologists, the doctors, everyone who's working on the front lines here. They're jeopardizing, you know, in many ways, their own health for the sake of the rest of us. It's super admirable. And, um, you know, it's been fun to, to be a little, you know, have a window into that through him. Have you thought about what the private sector and wealthy individuals can, can do to help out? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think each of us should work in our own community. So Jeffrey and I, um, together, we gave a million dollars to the mayor's fund in Los Angeles to really work on three things. Um, try to get the homeless population into a safer place. The homeless population is very vulnerable to this, right? Um, so then the second one, which we care a lot about, is childcare for these healthcare workers and first responders. You know, think about it. all these children are out of school and their parents, you know, have to go to work. What is going to happen to these kids? So the mayor's doing a whole host of things around childcare for, for those two groups. And then thirdly, you know, how do you set up, you know, sort of mobile um, medical um, facilities? So we've done that. We um, opened it up also to um, an employee match for Quibi employees. And I think those are the kinds of things that we you know, have to do. I'm so admiring of you know, Ford making face shields and you know, all these other companies, you know, General Motors doing things. I mean, all these companies are, are you know, what it's called the War, War Production Act. I mean, they're doing in some ways what they did during World War II, which is make um, gear for the healthcare profession, which is so admirable. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit about you and your background. And I read an interview where you said if you had to do it all over again, you'd be an engineer. Why I is will. that? <laughs> well, I think technology has been the defining industry of the last generation. And I think it will be the defining industry of the next generation. And I was an economics major, um, which I loved. But if I, as I said, if I had to do it over again, I think you know, being in computer science or engineering teaches you a discipline of, of you know, how to think and, and um, how to work, but also gives you a familiarity with the core of, you know, the engine of this economy, which is technology. And so I had to learn that on the job, and um, which I did over many years. If I had to do it over again, as I said, I would just force myself to be an engineer because I just think it would help me understand um, you know, what the next generation of ideas and things were going to be. So it would maybe not have been as easy as economics and other things, but I almost, you know, for many years of my career, I said, why was I not a computer scientist? <laughs> right. Right. Well, in retrospect, it looks more obvious than it was maybe back then. Yeah, right? I mean, I graduated from college in 1977. It wasn't completely obvious that that was right. the thing to do. But yeah. Now, I noticed in your career, I mean, you're sort of known for your time at eBay and HP, but you had a lot of other jobs before then. So did you have a clear vision in mind that I want to do this, 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 and then end up at the head of a big company? Or what was your thinking early on? No, no. I mean, I started out in college. I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, I think it's I've been told, uh, you told many times, I, I hit organic chemistry. And I was like, hmm, I don't think this is really going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're not the first person to hit that, right? <laughs> and uh, then I sold advertising for a student publication in college. And I said, you know, I, actually, this business thing could be kind of interesting. And I went to Harvard Business School straight out of college, which was very unusual at the time. And um, when I graduated, I said, I just, you know, I don't know quite what I want to do, but I love marketing. And so I decided to go to the very best place that one could go at the time, which was Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it's great fun because I'm now on the board, you know, in a full full circle, first job, now on the board. And um, and then I just, you know, worked my way up through organizations. I never really dreamed I'd be a CEO. 
I didn't really have a plan. My husband and I worked out, you know, our careers um, together. Sometimes he went where he needed to go. Sometimes I did. And, um, you know, but always just put my head down and tried to do the very best job I knew how to do and, you know, be fun to work with and be a great team player. How did you change jobs? I mean, you went from this job to, to that job and it was just you'd have job offers and you'd you sort of went into enter, entertainment and then you went to technology back and forth a little bit, right? Yeah, well, sometimes um, actually it was um, they came to me, but sometimes mm-hmm. Griff and I traded off career. So I was at Procter and Gamble. I loved Procter and Gamble. I might still be at Procter and Gamble, but then my husband got a chance to um, join the brain tumor or to um, uh, do neurosurgery residency at UCSF, and mm-hmm. he really wanted to go. So I looked for a job in San Francisco and joined Bain, and then I got a chance to go to Disney after ten years at Bain. And uh, we commuted for a number of years. And then he got a chance to run the brain tumor program at Harvard's teaching hospital, the Mass General in Boston. He really wanted to go. I really didn't want to go. But sometimes in life, you have to do things that you don't want to do. So we moved to Boston. That's how I ended up at StrideRight and then Hasbro. And then I got the offer to go to um, eBay. He really didn't want to leave the Mass General. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, was able to get a job at Stanford running their brain tumor program. So sometimes it was a headhunter call, but sometimes it was the other one, uh, you know, chasing, chasing the spouse to a different place. Uh, that's quite the partnership. How long have you guys been married? Uh, 40 years in June. Yeah, it sounds like it's working. Yeah. So um, <laughs> eBay sounds like this giant, big company, successful company. But when you joined it, it was basically a startup, right? Yeah, 30 people, $4 million in revenue um, and joined uh, Pierre Almidiar, one of the great founders. Right. And so what made you, it was kind of a flyer then, wasn't it? Yeah, you have to remember it was the earliest days of the internet. Most of us were barely doing, um, uh, you know, email. And uh, so I got a call from a headhunter and um, I said, you know, I'll, I'll go out and talk to Pierre. I'm pretty sure I don't want this job, but it sounds kind of interesting and, and I might want the headhunter's next job. And uh, went out and met with Pierre, and I saw something very early on. I, I have a model of great consumer products where, um, you know, it does it allow you to do something you couldn't do before, features and functionality? And is there an emotional connection to the brand? And, in fact, that's what I saw um, at, at eBay because he said, you know, we make inefficient markets efficient. You know, before eBay, you had to shop in your sort of local area. And then... Um, you know, people have met their best friends on eBay, in some ways, the first social networking platform. And I said, wow, okay, I think we should do this. And I called my husband from San Francisco airport and said, hon, I think we should move back to California for this. And so we we took a risk, but, um, you know, it it was, you know, one of those great things. He was able to get a job at Stanford and, but two new jobs, two new schools for the kids. And we were, you know, off and running. And then you did have that aforementioned outage. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, we did. Um, it was we were twenty two hours hard down. Can you imagine? I mean, unthinkable day, right? It was unthinkable, and um, you know, completely traumatic. We vaporized ten billion dollars of market cap in twenty four hours, and uh, and then we had to rebuild. You know, I had to you know hire a new head of technology and and rebuild um, all along the way, and. Um, you know, but it was a remarkably searing experience, but pulled the company together and I think made eBay a better company because it had happened to us. And then later on, you hired John Donahoe, who's now CEO of Nike, right? Nike. Yeah. 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 So how did you guys end up working together? Yeah, well, we worked together at Bain and uh, he worked for me at Bain for many years. And I always thought he was one of the most talented um, people I'd ever have a chance to work with. And uh, so I said, you might remember back in the day, I said I was going to stay 10 years at eBay. I said, that's the right amount of time for a company CEO of a new company. Um, You know, these companies become like your babies. And, you know, sometimes there needs to be a fresh perspective. And so I asked John to join me about three years before I stepped down, thinking he would be a great, um, you know, uh, heir, a parent, if you will, and, and ultimately take over for me. And, um, and so he came and he did, and he really, he did such a nice job and is just a wonderful human being. I think he's going to be super successful. He was very successful at service now, and I think he's going to be successful at, uh, at Nike. And he's just a marvelous, marvelous, wonderful individual. Yeah. So HP, um, what did, what did you get out of that experience, Meg? Yeah. Lots and lots of things. First of all, it was enormous scale. When I arrived, 325,000 people 
75,000 contractors, seven major lines of business selling in 190 countries through 270,000 VARs, you know, value-added resellers. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. And lots and lots of challenges. And um, I learned many, many things there. But um, probably the most important was, did you ever read that book by Lou Gerstner that says who that is titled Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? I sure did, yeah. And what he said at the beginning of the book, he said, you know, when I got to IBM, I thought culture mattered. By the time I left, I thought culture was the only thing that mattered. And I took that on board and um, saw that at HP. And then, you know, just went to work and said, how do we bring back this incredible icon? And it was a different time and place. And I thought HP was actually too big. You know, this is a time for small, nimble companies and technology. And I thought it was too big. And ultimately, through lots of consultation with the board, we decided to split HP into two companies. And there were two Fortune 50 companies embedded in HP. Right. And, uh, and so we set them off to be, you know, on their own with a cost structure that e each industry could undertake and a chance to be successful. And, um, you know, short of recent history, HP Inc. has been very successful and so has Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So it was co totally the right thing to do. And then I became the CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise and we split it again into, into, two, into three total pieces. Right. So let's talk a little bit about Silicon Valley now, Meg, because, I mean, there were the old school Goliaths going back to HP and Cisco and maybe that era. And then you had a lot of fragmentation during dot com. And now things have consolidated again with the fangs. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there are people who suggest, of course, that the fangs are too powerful, that they need to be broken up or at least more closely regulated. What's your take on that? Yeah. So, I mean, this is the history of Silicon Valley, right? It is one of those special places where companies beget other companies, their consolidation, there's fragmentation. And um, so I probably would not necessarily be in favor of breaking these companies up. I think there will be new competitors. It may take another few years, but I think there will be new competitors that will do something better than they do. And it will be that repetition of what has made Silicon Valley so special. And um, listen, there's a big responsibility to running these enormous companies now that have such a you know, say over how we think about the world, you know, how we buy things, how we connect with each other. And um, you know, so I think the leaders of those companies and the culture of those companies has to be very mindful of the public trust that uh, that they hold, you know, in in their companies today, and that's you know that's a challenge. Um, and uh, but I think that's that's the most important thing right now that that these companies can think through. Yeah, I mean, there's misinformation that has to be looked at um, in terms of Facebook. There's Amazon's market power. There's Google's market share in terms of search. There's a whole host of issues. Do you think Washington gets it, Meg? Um, listen, Washington, I think, is trying to understand. It's very difficult. You know, when I was at eBay, I interacted with a lot of senators and a lot of congressmen. They have an enormous job. Like, it's not their full-time job to understand any particular industry. And, uh, and so it's very hard. You know, many of them were not brought up in the digital age, so it's hard for them to understand. I do think there, there's a number of, of members of Congress who are, who are understanding of what's happening, who have a good point of view here. But it's a very difficult thing. I mean, the economy is gigantic and complex, um, more interconnected than it's ever been. And I think it's really hard for them to have a handle on everything. They're trying. I mean, these hearings on Capitol Hill, I think, are probably pretty helpful. They come on listening tours to, to Silicon Valley all the time. But it's hard for them. Right. And let's talk a little bit about convergence in terms of technology and entertainment, because you guys are at that nexus. Yeah. Um, what is what is the business, those two businesses, or what is that all going to look like, say, five years from now, Meg? Well, well interestingly, um, there is a long history in Hollywood of technology enabling new ways to tell stories. And I was sort of interested to go through the history and say, you know, before there was movies, there was the motion picture camera. Before there was television, there was the TV technology and the cathode ray tubes, Right. Before there was, um, you know, Quibi, there was this device. And we said if we could build a, a, a technology platform that, as I said, enabled Hollywood quality content for this device, maybe we could unleash a true convergence of, of tech and media. And that's what we've tried to do. 
And um, it's very interesting because many companies were tech companies who've tried to become media companies or media companies who've tried to become tech companies. We're trying something entirely different, which is how can we have them be on equal footing, equal partners from the beginning? And uh, of course, it starts with Jeffrey and me. And it starts with um, putting that technology team right next to the creative team. And if you think about it, what most creators do is they make their movie, they figure out what they're doing, and then they throw it over the wall to the technology team as opposed to involving that team from the very beginning. And that's what we're doing that's really quite different. And it's not been done before. And don't underestimate the challenge of doing it. These two communities are very different. Hollywood is primarily, it's a generalization, but right brain creative storytellers. Silicon Valley is largely left brain analytical thinkers, mostly engineers. And, you know, if Jeffrey and I are any example, we come at things in a really different way. It is our superpower, but, um, you know, it's hard to do. And um, but I think it is, you know, a true convergence of these two things. And how do we enable the content community and how does the content community inform the engineers about what could be the next generation of technology that will make a big difference to them? Interesting. Last couple of questions. Um, Meg, what about the presidential election? Yeah. You support both Democrats and Republicans. I have. Oh, your Donald Trump has not been a favorite of yours, at least historically. Um, and then it looks like we'll have Biden on the Democrat side. What's yeah. your take on that? So, um, you know, you're right. I, I, I sort of I've always voted for, you know, who I thought would be the best person. And, um, you know, I'm still sorry that my longtime friend from Bain, Mitt Romney, um, you know, was never elected president. I think he would have been a remarkable president through thick, thin, through all kinds of things. He's just a remarkable guy. So I'm I'm sorry he didn't win. Um, you know, I, I try to stay out of politics now that I'm at Quibi. And uh, when we get a little closer to the time, I'm sure I'll come forward with who I'm going to support. But I try to, our, our new shows are non-political. We try to stay straight down the middle. So I think I'll stay out of this one for a little while. Fair enough. May check back with you on that. And finally, this show is called Influencers, Megan. I'm just wondering how you see using your influence on the world going forward? Yeah. Well, I think we all have to pick something that we care deeply about. And my passion is education. You know, I, I said to myself maybe 10 or 15 years ago, if I could help with one thing in our country, we could do so many things. There's climate change, there's income inequality, there's so many things. I said, if I could just make a small impact on one area, it would be K through 12 education. Because when every child has access to a great education, it changes their lives. And uh, so that's when I got involved with Teach for America. I was so pleased when they asked me to be chairman of Teach for America. Um, you know, and now particularly at this time, it's a very difficult time for teachers, right? They're being asked to, if you think we're being asked to do something different, they are really being asked to do something different. And the children are struggling, right? You know, many of these children, they're, you know, as I said before, their parents aren't home during the day and they have to go to work. So um, it's just been a joy for me. And, and Teach for America has done an amazing um, job over the last 40 years, founded by an entrepreneur named Wendy Kopp. So that's where I put um, most of my energy. And um, anything I can do to you know, think about how we can reshape K-12 through education is a passion of mine. And if I can make a small difference um, in that arena, I'll be super pleased and, and happy to have contributed. All right. Meg Whitman, CEO of Quibi, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Great to see you. Be safe. You've been watching Influencers. This is Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.